This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. If there is one question we get asked a lot here at the Garden Gurus, it's how about you come to my place and build a garden? Well, how about we do just that? Here's your chance to win an amazing $20,000 edible garden makeover. All you have to do is head to our Facebook page, like it and share a photo of your garden and tell us in 25 words or less why a Garden Gurus edible garden could transform your life. Whilst online, check out our Instagram page for great garden inspiration. Good luck. Yeah. Hello and welcome to the Garden Gurus. Hello, welcome to the Garden Gurus. I'm Trevor Cochran. It's great to be with you this morning and solving some pretty cool problems to have this time of the year. So we're moving into springtime. Now we've got so much coming up on today's show, but first up, I wanted to apologize because uh, it's my fault that we were delayed in starting this morning. No technical issues, just me. Um, you might notice that I'm coming through to you a lot clearer than I was before. And that's because I just had my second jab. Hopefully, all of you guys out there are getting your vaccine sorted out so that we together as a community can live happier and safer without risk. It's obviously a pretty difficult time out there with more than half the country in lockdown. And uh, let's hope that we get very soon to the point where lockdowns are a thing of the past. Now, enough with COVID because we've talked about it enough in the last year and a half, but I do wanna say a huge thank you to you right up front. Um, we were actually uh, just just uh, on the weekend, out of the blue, uh, I wasn't aware it was going on, but we were notified that we are Australia's fifth most popular gardening podcast. Now, um, that's very much uh, appreciated and very much due to your support, and thank you very much for that. It was a very exciting little accolade. There's some very talented um, podcasts out there coming through, and we are part of that, and we feel very privileged to have been recognised. Now, this week uh, is a, a pretty big week for us. We've got the Garden Gurus TV series coming up this Saturday. There's some old faces that are back. We've got a brand new presenter joining us this series. I'll introduce you to her pretty soon. Um, she's an absolutely lovely person, and she's going to share an element of uh, the backyard that um, that's very important to all of us, um, very important to us as friends. Uh, speaking of friends, good mate David Van Berkel will join us. He's got some great summer flowering plants, and believe it or not, now's the start time to start thinking about planting for summer colour. We've got great prizes to give away. I have got packet seeds, as we always do, and a copy of my book, Delish, that I have written with Neville Passmore. So we'll have all of those for you to win and Lockie will be choosing winners for the best questions. Now, please remember when you send your question in, tell us where you're from, tell us what state you're in, where, where your suburb is or, or ideally if it's a town. So we can kind of get a bit of a feeling for what the environment's like at any one moment in time. Before we, uh, before we get going to our very first interview, which is not far away, I just wanted to give you a quick weather rundown. In Perth, it is magnificent. We've just come off a spectacular weekend. 
And uh, I know Melbourne had a spectacular weekend, but bad news is it's 13 degrees and showers there today. Sydney's 22 degrees and sunny. Um, this is the perfect time to be planting in Sydney. Um, Brisbane. Brisbane's an interesting uh, temperature. I can't quite work out what that one is just at the moment. It's currently 126 according to my screen. I suspect that it's probably 26. It is and partly cloudy. Um, the rainfall there has been below average. So a few little challenges in Brisbane, Adelaide and also Melbourne at the moment with regards to rainfall, whereas most of the other states are well above average. Adelaide, 16 degrees. It's pretty cool there today. Hobart, speaking of cool, 9 degrees. And Darwin, it's 35 degrees in Darwin and sunny. And it's going to be, well, another beautiful day in the tropics. And with that in mind, I think we might move on and get into our first segment of the day. First up, we're actually going to have an interview. It's with one of our absolute favourites, Karen Goldie from Love the Garden. She's back joining us with the show. Karen, good morning. Good morning, Trevor. How are you? I'm exceptional. Look at your place every time. It is magnificent. What are you doing there? Yeah, so uh, I've started dabbling in some water plants or hydro plants um, yep. just for something a little bit different. Uh, I sort of came across it by accident, actually, because, you know, I love all my indoor, indoor plants, but... Um, I had a few little accidents where, you know, a few <laughs> branches, a few little stems broke off. Yep. And so I, I found myself just popping them in a in a vase of water and making myself some new, new little plants. So I thought, well, let's just, let's give this a go. And, uh, yeah, it's actually, well, it's a fun lockdown activity. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and hello to all my friends and family in, in Sydney as well. I'm thinking of you all and missing you dearly. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so uh, I've, I've had a bit of a bit of a play actually. It's a little bit. I'm finding it a little bit addictive, but something so, a little bit different. Karen, this this is um, something. It probably all started with the lucky bamboo for for many people um, about ten years ago when they were really just becoming incredibly popular. Everybody seemed to have one, and of course, it's it's just a, another one of those plants that can and can grow in soil quite happily, but is also very happy to be in a jar with water. And uh, I can see you've got spathophyllums there. Yes, yes, and and I mean that's what that's what I've discovered is is. You know, plants basically need, I think, four elements. Correct me if I'm wrong, Trevor, but they need water. So tick, that's covered. Yep. Uh, we, we need air, mm -hmm. we need light, and we need nutrients. Mm -hmm. And that's where Evergreen Garden Care now comes in is I had all the other first three all covered, but now we've actually got some nutrients in a little oh. pump and feed pack. So that's sort of brilliant. Like everything you need now. Yeah, Karen, that, that's a really brilliant thing because that was the killer of Lucky Bamboo. So that was why people's Lucky Bamboo ran out of steam was that they didn't have any nutrients. Water is water and, and yep. they definitely need the water, but they needed nutrients. And we didn't have a fertiliser to be able to apply that way previously. So tell me about, is this a foliar feed? You feed over the foliage? No, no. It's actually one that you apply directly into the water. Wow. So it actually feeds through the roots. And I'll just show you a demonstration. Demonstration. There's a, a jar just with some water in it. Yep. And if you have a look, it's pre-mixed up, but it's clear. So there's no yeah. staining and there's no yeah. odour. And that's always been one of the, the problems, one of the, the complaints about growing in, in um, transparent glass and jars is that once you sometimes, you know, once you apply that, that liquid fertiliser, it might leave some browning or it could be green in colour, uh, mm -hmm. whereas this is nice and clear. So it's really, really simple and easy to use. And it's just five pumps per 500 mils. So basically the ratio is, is one pump to 100 mils of water. Wow. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. now, tell me, can that be used for flowering and foliage indoor plants? Yes. Yes, it can. Yep, yep, most definitely. Have you got a top five indoor plants that look great in that environment? Well, I've had really good success, as you can see here, with the peace lily. Uh, yep. that, that surprised me, actually. Uh, and I think the secret there is once you pop it into your uh, container is to make sure that the crown sits just above the water level. 
uh, okay. so that it doesn't get too too waterlogged. Um, that's that's been my, I think my my main thing that I found with that. Yeah. Um, so peace lilies has probably been my main go to. Philodendrons as well um, had really good success uh, with that as well. Yeah. And as you can see, this is a special little hydro planter that I actually purchased. So it, it's got a little cradle at the top. Yep. To sit planting, you weigh it down with some, some pebbles, pop some pebbles in the bottom, and then the roots will naturally find their way down to the water. And that's what I also love as well is there's so so many different uh, decorative pebbles and um, decorative accents that you can purchase now that you can mm. actually get lots of pebbles to match your decor. So it doesn't just have to be a, a plain container. Uh, and there's also little little test tubes as well. So syngoniums, that's another one that I've had really good success with. Uh, and this was this was actually from from one that I accidentally broke off a bigger plant. And you can see how the, how the roots there have actually curled around and, and are growing to the to the size of the of the tube, which is which is really really quite cute. And the other good part is a lot of these jars and things. I mean, this one I, I did purchase. Um, specifically from a nursery, but you can you can just use jars from the op shop. You can yep. buy glass bars. You can go. You know how much I love op shopping. So yep. you can sort a lot of this from the op shop as well, and and do it. It's quite quite inexpensive. And or just, the or just is, or I was going to say just recycle the jars that you've got coming through the household as you use them in the kitchen, right? Yeah, absolutely. And another one that I love to use is wine carafes. So, I mean, there's only so many wine carafes, I guess, that you can use at any one time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to be able to free mine up from what they've got in them currently. <laughs> well, I freed up a couple. And this one, look, this one's an, a, bit, a bit of an embarrassing story. Um, you can, can you see how green yeah. that water is in there, the algae? I've, I, this was one I neglected. This was actually one that actually accidentally broke off. So I just popped it in my wine carafe with some water. And you can see there I have neglected this one for a few weeks. Normally I would change the water every two weeks yeah. and then fertilise with the liquid fertiliser once a week. But just a little, a little tip to clean out because obviously they do tend to get a little bit of algae. They will go green. I mean, that one's been sitting there for, for quite a while neglected. But a really a little tip on how to clean this without any chemicals is I'll just tip out that water. I use rice. So just put in some grains of rice into the bottom. Right. Pop in, pop in a little bit of water. And then we just give it a swizzle. That's the best that's swizzle the I've seen. <laughs> well, well done. You, you, you can see I've had a little bit of experience with wine. <laughs> <laughs> and then we just tip that out, give it another little rinse, and that just, without chemicals, cleans off all the algae that was that was in your in your jar, and it's all nice, nice and clean. Karen, that's just uh, it's another fantastic tip that you have shared with us again today. Now, tell me this this um, Scott's Osmocote pump and feed for indoor water plants. Yep. Where can people get their hands on it? Is it commonly available at the moment? Yeah, so it's commonly available now at Bunnings. Bunnings right. placed uh, an order uh, when we released this. Yep. And it's, it's now on the shelf. It's it's in stores. I've seen it in stores even here in South Australia. Mm -hmm. And five ninety nine. So again, a really good price point. Five really ninety nine for that big bottle of fertilizer. Yep. That's crazy. Yep. 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 So nearly two hundred and fifty mils of, of liquid fertilizer in there with no odor, no staining, no color. Really easy to use. Uh, we're also using recycled plastic now in our um, packaging and also the container can be um, recycled as well. So um, just um, take the, the pump off. The pump's actually got a metal spring in there. Yep. So we discard that, but we can recycle the actual bottle and pop that, give it a rinse, pop it in your recycling bin and happy days.
Fabulous. You've done a great job, Karen. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Another great product, but of course, a great idea. And that's the thing of growing indoor plants in water. It's a really good indication as to just um, how you can utilise all those extra long strappy bits of growth and so on that we get and yeah. uh, turn them in. And, and I'm going to give you my top five uh, indoor plants. Oh, yes. Philodendrons, spathophyllums, absolutely fantastic yep. for, for that yep. use. Um, I would say to you that probably one of the better ones is that is that uh, Dracaena, that um, lucky bamboo, absolutely okay. brilliant plant um, and, and still used extensively right across Asia because it is so good inside the house. Um, what else? Where are we? Um, what did I say? I was in one, two, three. Oh, uh, Syngoniums, a uh, brilliant yes. plant for that. Yeah. And, and again, you can get compact ones where you can get them all stretching and growing. Um, and if you really want to do something a little bit different, um, Monstera. So mm -hmm. they can get sort of, um, there's a whole bunch of obviously different types of Monstera, but the Swiss cheese one is mm -hmm. fantastic in that environment as well. I haven't tried that one yet, but that is my favourite potted indoor plant. So There you go. I'll there give you that go. one a go next. All right. Well, look, you take care. Hopefully... Um, Hopefully lockdown for everybody in Australia finishes sometime soon because I think we've all got a bit of fatigue with it, but um, we all have to stay safe and keep looking after each other. So, Karen, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate you joining us this morning. Thanks again, Trevor, for having me. Goodbye, no. everyone, and stay safe. All right, take care. Now, look, um, we have had so many questions um, coming through, and I think I might start in the Northern Rivers of New South Wales. Um, Jeanette sent... Uh, um, a note through her Eucharist lilies. Um, they're beautiful things, sometimes known as pineapple lilies, are starting to put up flowers. And I found the new shoots have been cut off by slugs. Could I give some advice on how you could eradicate them? Yes. Uh, bluestone, copper is the key with any of those mollusks. So snails and slugs. Um, if you get a little bit of bluestone, if they're in pots, then uh, a little circle around the inside of the pot. If it's in the garden, better around the outside. There are some uh, iron and copper-based sprays you can get in your local garden centre as well. Maybe you might want to check out Garden Express online and see what they've got. Uh, Clinton's in Perth. He's got mango trees. Now, mangoes have had a pretty tough time in Perth because it's been a lot colder and wetter than we're used to. And as such, he's saying he's got brown leaf curl. He sprayed with Mangazeb, but it's not doing any good. Can I help? I can because the sun's come out, Clinton, and that's what your mango trees really need. They need some warm weather at the moment. Um, the the Mangazeb will stop some of those diseases that, that mangoes do get. Um, probably the, the worst of them um, is, uh, is a bacterial disease, so it's better treated with a combination of Mancozeb and one of the copper-based sprays, something like Coside. Um, and if you go into a, you know, a, a pattern where you spray one, then spray the other, and then spray the other, and then spray the other, you'll clean off any of the bacterial spores or any fungal spores that might be doing any damage as well. But what your mango desperately needs right at the moment is some warm weather. And as soon as you see new growth coming, that's the time to feed them. Hope that helps, Clinton. Hannah is in southeast Victoria. Can I use Troforte on my potted lemon tree or do I need to feed it with citrus food? Well, Troforte comes with a specialised citrus blend, so you can use that. To be quite honest, um, those controlled release fertilisers are really the way to go. So Osmocote, Troforte, get the special blends designed for citrus um, and you'll do very well. Cheryl and Marcus, you're in Mandra. Um, what are the best grasses for attracting butterflies. Interestingly enough, um, grasses don't attract butterflies as a general comment. Butterflies really are looking for sweetness. So they're looking for flower. And there is a plant called the butterfly bush, um, Budlia. And it's just coming into flower in my garden at the moment. And, and last week, somebody raised it. They had a giant one, one of the yellow forms. Um, they attract phenomenal amounts of butterflies and they do a really good job at feeding them in the early early part of the season. So Budlia, if you look into it, you can get some beautiful colours, reds, pinks, and some glorious sort of purples and blues. And um, I would suggest that you get them planted into the garden about now and start feeding those, um, those butterflies. As far as birds go, well, birds, bees, again, really flowers are the way to go. Um, Margaret in Belgrave, actually in Victoria, is also raised this as a point she said she wants to attract birds butterflies bees 
Again, Budlia, good one to go for. Right at the moment, believe it or not, I've got agaves that are in flower and um, you will have also seen the aloes out there in flower. They're a wonderful source of food for bees in the in the latter part, the cooler part of winter when there's still not a lot of natives coming into flower. So they're a great option for you. And then, of course, another, oh, well, it depends where you are. In some places, they're really coming into flower well now, but it's been a cold, wet winter here, so it's been a lot slower. Um, so we're only seeing some of the natives just starting to burst their flowers. But things like hardened bergiers, which have been in flower, great source of of food for birds and for bees. I hope that helps. Now, um, I mentioned earlier uh, at the beginning of the show that the Garden Gurus returns to Channel 9 this weekend. You're going to see a new face pop up um, over the 18 weeks that we're uh, on air on Channel 9. And uh, we thought that uh, maybe you might like to take a little look at what's coming up in our first episode. We're all about making gardening easy and showing you the latest innovation. And this weekend, I have got some innovation that's gonna blow your mind. This is the latest battery technology from Still. And believe me, this will leave your garden looking fantastic all year round for half the effort. This weekend on The Garden Gurus. You can see we're on the cutting edge of gardening right here at the Garden Gurus, thanks to our friends at Still. Now, this week, we have got a new face that's going to join us, and I really wanted to introduce you to Dr. Lydia. Now, she is a, a very, very talented gardener, but she's also a vet. And I thought, well, look, there's so many things that Lydia could probably uh, present on the show that would inspire you or share some of her amazing knowledge. And I thought maybe we might ask her to say hello on our show here today, give you the insight. Hello, Lydia, how are you? Hello. It's good Hi, to see thanks you. thanks for having me. It's great to see you on this beautiful day. Now, you've oh, got, um, you've already done a couple of stories for, for the Garden Gurus coming up and uh, chickens is the first one. And I wanted to tell you right up front, thank you so much for coming around my place and filming and giving me some advice on our chickens because I thought they were all 100% happy, um, maybe with one that wasn't. And as it turns out, uh, when, when we went through, you showed me they had lice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's I've quite common. <laughs> I've dusted them all. Yeah, well done. <laughs> now, now tell me, um, what what's probably the best things uh, about having chickens in a home backyard from your point of view? Oh, I love them because they just have such unique personalities, and mine yeah. just run to me when I come and feed them in the morning, and um, I just love. Yeah, just feeding and interacting with them. And the eggs are a bonus, but just really just spending time with them. They're just, I think after after my dog, they're my next best, um, my next favorite animal, I, I would say. Yeah, just really love working and interacting with them. And they're just so useful in the garden as well. Mm. Um, scratching, tilling, spreading mulch. They're, they're the, yeah. the, the cult, cultivator of the garden. Plus, I know that pretty much at the moment we've got a bit of a, a rush of flick weed in my garden, which is very easy yeah. to weed, weed out. Um, they love it. They, they'll they hoe through yeah. it. And, and uh, the other one it sounds like flick weed, but it's not. It's chickweed. It's another one in another area. And yeah. again, they love it. They, they just enjoy they eating those weeds. Yeah. It's a, it's a very cool thing. Tell me a little bit about maybe some of the tips of keeping your chickens healthy. Um, hygiene is definitely one of them. Just making sure that um, we keep on top of their litter and all the manure that they produce, which is a great um, addition to compost mm -hmm. and plants love it. And just having really good, healthy diet and clean water and just every day for me, it's just checking on them, just keeping an eye on them, just seeing how they behave, whether they're active, whether they're eating well. Um, yeah, just just watching watching them. And also shell grit is really important for layers, just to have that calcium to build healthy shells for eggs. Um, yeah, look, they're so productive. I've, I've got... Um 
I've had eyes of browns in the past and high lines. Um, they, they are really uh, a very, very productive chicken, aren't they? Not all chickens are as productive as that. They all operate at different levels, but the, the nutrient is a vitally important part. So calcium, obviously, for eggshells is a very important addition to the diet. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you find that, um, that if you're not keeping up uh, on the nutritional side of things, that it can be quite problematic from the from the, the chicken's health point of view? Yeah, I've had um, some health challenges in mind and um, and sometimes it's not due to um, anyone's fault. I think because with chickens, they sometimes have birds come in as well and they yep. interact. And then as they get older as well, sometimes they get health issues. And so it's just keeping on top of it or when they get broody or when they molt, it's just giving them some extra TLC during those times. Yeah, yeah, and I'm quite fortunate. I have friends who are bird vets that when I have um, struggles with my chickens, I sort of um, touch base with them and they give great advice. Um, so that that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah. Your, your advice to me was um, it's probably a good idea to be dusting or spraying the chickens to, to get rid of lice. Now, lice, um, where I live, it's normally pretty uh, sort of dry, which would be a very good environment for them to live in. So I thought, well, I'll get in and, and dust them. So I went and got the, the poultry dust, and I noticed that it it's actually um, doesn't have any withholding period on it because it uses um, a, a natural insecticide, a naturally occurring insecticide from a plant, which... Um, I didn't realise you could get those things. It was quite by accident I discovered Sorry. it, but it's a good, good, good Just, healthy uh, way to look after your chooks. Oh, I think we've lost Lydia. I think we have. Oh, well, that's a bit of a shame. Well, look, Lydia, I, I think we've lost you, unfortunately, but um, we'll share a few more tips, obviously, this Saturday on uh, The Garden Gurus on Channel 9 when people will get a chance to actually have um, have a look at you in action as you do your first story. Thanks for joining us this morning. Yep. Just keep thinking, we're having some deliveries and so there's the truck in the background causing quite a yeah. lot of background noise, I'm afraid. I'm so sorry about that. That's all right. No problems. It's lovely seeing you. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. Okay, we'll see you again soon. Now, you know what? It is one of the most remarkable things, but we probably every single day get asked for by people, um, when will you come around and uh, look after my, or help me with my garden? One of the more common ones is, will you come around and build me a garden? So we thought this series, we would run a competition. And uh, this is what's coming up. This is your big chance to have the garden gurus turn your backyard into an edible garden. If there is one question we get asked a lot here at the Garden Gurus, it's how about you come to my place and build a garden? Well, how about we do just that? Here's your chance to win an amazing $20,000 edible garden makeover. All you have to do is head to our Facebook page, like it and share a photo of your garden and tell us in 25 words or less why a Garden Guru's edible garden could transform your life. Whilst online, check out our Instagram page for great garden inspiration. Good luck. Well, there you go. I hope that you're going to jump online. You are the very first people who have seen this promo your chance to get in early, get your entries in. What a great prize. Could you imagine what $20,000 can do as far as transforming your garden into an edible garden? It's amazing. And this covers everything from irrigation, controller, water supply connections, right through to soil improvement, plants, raised garden beds. We've got it all planned for this series. So um, this is the prize to join. It is only six weeks that you have an opportunity to get in and enter but be the first in, um, first in best dressed, I reckon is the best way to go. Now, I thought I might just raise this before we move too much further. I've got a plan of the week and I want to talk to you about that, but I want to show you this. I had a very, very upset person on the weekend say that they 
are really disappointed with their four-year-old lime tree, which has just produced limes. And unfortunately, they started out green, but they turned up yellow in the end. So it's got to be a faulty tree, right? Because the limes you buy in the supermarket are always green. Well, I've got some good news and some bad news. These have all come from the same tree in my garden. And you can see that when they get older, they turn yellow. And that's what happens with limes, with all types of limes, whether they be Tahitian like these, uh, West Indian, or even the Kaffir lime. It'll start out green, but it will end up turning yellow. If you love them when they're green and they're a little bit, there's a little bit more tart to the to the um, to the juice, then pick them green. But if you start to see them changing colour, and you can see this one's just getting a light yellow starting to come through it, we'll pick them at that stage, and you'll be able to enjoy them as uh, as they are. And yeah, so don't go getting upset. It's not a faulty tree. It's just that limes do eventually turn yellow, just as lemons do. Now, my plant of the week. Get a load of this. You probably saw the photo, the promo photo. This is one bunch of about, oh, I reckon, 15 I've got at home at the moment of bananas. Now, growing your own bananas, there is nothing better. They are so sweet because they're sun ripened and they are absolutely delicious. And bananas are good for you. In fact, they're very good for your mental health because they release uh, endorphins into your system when you eat them that make you feel happy. So if you've wondered why bananas make you feel good, that'd be the reason why. Growing them at home, really easy to do. So you just want a bright, sunny spot, a free draining soil, and a good water supply. They do need water to get established, but once they're established, they don't need huge amounts of water to maintain themselves. They develop a pretty good root system in under the ground that actually allows them to, um, to really do quite well. But um, one of my favorite plants, believe it or not, I love the tropical effect that you get to have walking through groves of bananas. And uh, of course, if, if you weren't aware, bananas are not a fruit as such, it is the fruit, but it's the fruit of a herb. So they are the biggest herb in the world. So they are the, the plant that emerges from a, a corm in the ground effectively, grows up and over an 18-month period, that stem comes up, it'll produce a flower that comes from right down the base, moves up through the stem, hangs down, produces the bananas. And once you've harvested those bananas, that whole stem, that whole trunk disappears. Well, it just rots away. It will not continue to grow. And a new one will emerge from underneath. That's the magic of bananas. I hope that you um, give them a go in your garden if you've got a bit of a room. They a bit of room. They are really, really good. Okay, we've talked limes. We've talked bananas. We've talked um, indoor water plants. We've talked chickens. And now we're going to go back to talking about your garden. So let's go to Sydney. Liz is in Sydney. Hello, Liz. Um, hope you're doing well. I've got fungus on a begonia in a pot. How should I best treat it? Now, it depends, Liz, because um, begonias typically um, have root rot or collar rot funguses, um, but they can also get foliage funguses. And the best thing to do when you're sending these sorts of questions through is to take a quick photo and send, us, send it back through to us so we can have a bit of a look and I'll be able to work out pretty quickly which way you go because you do treat them with different fungicides. Um, it's highly likely that it is a root rot and that you'll need something from Yates called Yates Anti-Rot. And it's a, it's a really good way to um, control collar rots and root rot. So I'm hoping that that's what the problem is. But help me out, send me a photo. And folks, don't forget, um, we're coming to you from YouTube. We're coming to you from our Facebook page. And also we are coming to you from uh, Garden Express's Facebook page. And we'll talk to, uh, to David from Garden Express not too far down the line. Francis is, is, is in uh, Kurumbara in Victoria. My artichoke plants are huge, around five feet tall. Um, now that they're so tall, will they still produce fruit? Well, um, the artichoke you're talking about, I'm pretty sure, is a globe artichoke. And uh, that is very tall, at five feet, so they're huge plants. Um, will they still produce fruit? Well, they'll produce a flower. Um, and before that flower opens, that is your artichoke that you'll eat. And it should be fine. The height of them really doesn't make any difference at all. Miss Cheeky, 72, from Sydney, came to us via YouTube. And she's got a question. I've planted a coral charm uh, peony tuber in June. It's now sprouted, which is great. I've noticed a small bud. Could you please tell me what to feed it with during the spring? 
absolutely use a controlled release fertilizer for peonies in fact it wouldn't hurt it just at the moment to use a liquid um so you don't want anything too strong really important that it's just a mild fertilizer um, but i would use a liquid probably one of the ideally one of the liquid organics um so power feed or something that's got those organic bases in it um and once you've got into a little bit more warmer weather and you're starting to move into it um a controlled release fertilizer so osmocote absolutely fantastic but get the one for azaleas and camellias it really does them the world of good peonies they are beautiful so they're known as peony rose as well and uh, the best ones i've ever seen grow in korea they are just amazing Hannah is in southeast Victoria. Hi, Hannah. Just wondering where is the best spot for my Cymbidium orchid in southeast Victoria? If I don't have a patio, do they like morning sun? Look, they, they don't mind morning sun at all. Um, I, I just actually got three from a breeder around the corner from where I live yesterday. And um, he grows them under shade cloth all year round and does very, very well with them, flowers them, no problems at all. But my experience has been that... Um, they are best kept in a sort of shady position as you move into the summer months, but around February, hopefully when the, the, the hottest of the days are, are gone, you get them into the brightest possible position you can have in the morning and then have afternoon shade to protect them. I think it's the same situation for you in Victoria. I think a bit of morning sun won't hurt, but you do want some protection from the hot afternoon sun as we move into summer. And I'm assuming that you have it in a, in a pot as well. And that is always the best way to grow them, I think. Margaret's in Belgrave. Uh, what is the best plant to put in a terrarium? Well, there are so many different plants to grow in terrariums, Margaret. It gets down to what you, <clears throat> what you really like. One of my favourite garden centres in Melbourne is a garden centre called Collector's Corner. They have a whole range of really interesting little succulent plants that make the most incredible indoor garden in a terrarium. They'd be great. Indoor plants, of course, are really good, but you do want to keep down to those really small growing varieties. Things like African violets, um, absolutely brilliant in that environment. Hopefully that helps. <clears throat> Let's keep moving. Dennis is in Western Sydney. My bromeliads are starting to flower. When's a good time to separate them? Is it too late now? Yes, it is, Dennis. Don't split them now. Let them flower and split them afterwards. And uh, a lot of bromeliads, when they they flowered, uh, that's the end of the parent plant and it's just the, the pups that will come up underneath and that's the time to separate them anyway. So I think that's what you should do. Ricky, you didn't tell us where you're from, but it doesn't matter because this question is one I can, I can answer quite quickly. Ricky wants to know the best fertilizer for indoor plants. Well, my view is this new um, product that has been released from, from the guys at, um, oh, I'm going to grab it. Hang on a second, I can see one right here. Okay, so the guys at Osmocote, I love your garden, they have this product. Now, this specific one is for cacti and succulents, but they have them for indoor plants. There's a whole range of them. Now, these are pre-mixed liquid fertilizers, so all you do is give it a shake, take the cap off, pour into the cap, and then pour the cap into the pot. It's that easy. There's no risk of burning. So as far as uh, a liquid fertilizer goes, if you did one of those caps every week into your favorite indoor plants pot, you will end up with great growth. There is no doubt about it. I hope you're enjoying the show so far today. Um, we are tracking pretty well. This is a um, good time for you to get your questions in. Um, don't forget also to give us a like, really important. Um, that lets your friends know, what one, that you're watching this, and two, that, um, that you like what we're doing and, and hopefully give them a chance to participate as well. And uh, we, I did also say earlier on at the beginning of the show, and I just want to say it one more time again, thank you so much for your support. We were voted the fifth most popular gardening podcast in Australia, and it's probably not exactly what we're, uh, we're known for. We were quite honoured to, uh, to be um, in that top five when you look at the talented people that are already doing it. Now, speaking of talented people, I've got to tell you, there's a bloke who grows some plants up in... Uh, up in the hills in Victoria, in the mountains, that does some pretty amazing things. His name's David Van Berkel. David, it's great to see you this morning. How are you going? How are you getting through lockdown? Uh, doing really well, mate. Even better now that I hear I'm part of the top five podcasts. I, I just smiled when you said that. And thought, How could you expect any less with the type of talent <laughs> that you get on with you there? So. 
thanks, mate. That's it's very kind of you. We um we we weren't honestly we weren't expecting that uh, that we were being there. You know, would sit in that sort of space, but it is a great honour because there's some very talented people out there doing some great work in communicating with the gardening public and um, to to be in there and supporting um, you know people who are just trying to get good results is a really important thing and it's something that you guys are doing so much with at the moment you must be just going crazy at the moment with um, orders coming through as people are locked down at home and looking around their gardens going well let's spend some time getting the garden into shape yeah, absolutely. Look, we uh, we were inundated for a bit there, Trev, as we spoke about. We uh, we sort of went a little bit quiet with the offers for a little bit, except the ones that we do here with you, um, yeah. which allowed us to catch up quite a lot. Uh, and of course, another weekend with people locked down and come in this morning to you know a huge number of orders again. So yeah, we're we're really great grateful for that and um, and really happy to be doing the work to keep people busy at home. Um, yeah. you know, with their online shopping. Uh, and, and then being able to use their their space uh, productively and and enjoy the um, the outdoors. Well, David, the thing is at the moment we're we're in a world where it's all about staying safe, and this is one way you can go garden shopping without any risk. You don't need to risk going into your local Bunnings or local garden centre at the moment. You can just jump online, sit down, work your way through the extensive catalogue of of items that you have, and. You know, there, there are so many things. There's a few old-fashioned plants, I think, that I know in Europe two years ago, the last time I was over there, had made a massive comeback. They were incredibly popular, and it was probably 25 years before when they had been as popular here in Australia. So, you know, we tend to see everything goes in cycles, and one plant that's definitely going to be at the top of the cycle, I think, in the next 12 months to probably five years are hippie astrums. Tell us a little bit about them. Uh, mate, you, you've hit the nail on the head there. And, uh, you know, hippie astrums were, were grown probably by a half a dozen people across the country really well. And, and I already saw a few years ago that people were, you know, maybe um, a little bit tired of them. There's a few of the older growers have got out. Uh, but hippie astrums, they're just these wonderful, beautiful, exotic bulbs that are actually really, really easy to grow. Uh, they love to be in pots. Um, that can flower around Christmas time, even as early as October. I know in South Australia, for example, an established bulb will be flowering from October. Um, mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful, huge stems um, and, and these massive blooms trip. Yeah. We have about 80 varieties on sale at the moment. Um, eight, did you say 80? Eight, zero. Eight. Eight zero, 80 varieties. It's become wow. my, my, I'm a dahlia grower from way back. That was my childhood uh, product. But, yep. um, but hippies, I've, I've been dedicated to hippies for about a decade now and, uh, and I just continue to learn so much about them um, and, and I love them because the variety and diversity is there. So I'm, I'm looking at the catalogue at the moment up. The flowers are huge, big trumpet flowers. They're spectacular. But the, the colours are just, they're just, there's a different, I, I can't believe the variety that we're looking at now. It's incredible. From from doubles, uh, you know, double flowering, bicolored doubles. I think uh, Splash is one of my favourites of uh, of the new ones this year. So yeah. um, you know, if it's new around the world, I'm trying to get hold of it and, and build it up here in Australia. So unlike every other country in the world, we have to get the bulbs in, we have to get them gassed in quarantine, grow yeah. them for a year to eighteen months. Uh, a lot of them suffer from the gassing. You know, there's been occasions where I've bought a thousand bulbs. And ended up with a hundred pieces that I can use at the end of that year. Gee. So it, it, it can be quite sad at times to, yeah. uh, to go through the harvest and, and find so few. But just looking at those pages on screen, Trevor, and, and you know that's that's the delight of it all is to see that diversity of um, of colour yeah. range. And David, uh, you know, a lot of people might be thinking about these when they think about bulbs, think about them outdoors, but this is one that grows incredibly well. Whilst it's in flower, you want it indoors, so grow it in a pot so you can bring it in, right? Absolutely. They, they, uh, the flowers form inside the bulb, you know, in the, um, in the year before. So if you were to, to take one of the bulbs that we've grown or even to dig one out of your garden, put in a lovely pot, probably about a 20-centimetre pot, uh, mm -hmm. and you can just watch that thing bloom Usually you'll get two stems, four blooms on each stem. Um, wow. just they're, they're a delight. Now, tell me, um, once once they've finished flowering indoors, 
people take them outside? Is that, that they best go in full sun? Do they are, are they better to grow in the garden, or are you better to try and keep growing them in pots? Uh, probably better in the garden. Like from a from a long term sustainability, if you put the bulb in the garden, you'll get lots of babies. We've had uh, Papilio is a really exotic one from South America. And, yep. uh, and I counted 26 babies on one of our bulbs uh, last Thursday. And wow. consistently getting 15 to 18 babies. They're going to be six or seven years away. But, you know, in the garden, the bulb will produce um, more, more babies for you, more bulblets that you can pull apart and, and increase your stock at home. Wow. Now, David, so people now you buy them as a as a dormant bulb, basically, and you, you guys provide them and, and ship them in the mail. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so there's no green, no foliage on it whatsoever. Uh, this this is their dormant time. A hippie astrum likes to live in the ground for a few years. So we don't harvest every bulb every year. We leave them at least two years. The first year they develop a new root structure. It grows yep. quite deep. Uh, and then the second year, you really get that plumpness uh, and the extra stem forms inside inside the bulb. So dormant bulbs at the moment, shipped in a box, plant it up, uh, and within a few weeks, you'll have the first leaves popping out. The roots will start to grow. Um, and depending on where you are and the warmth that you've got, a warmer place will give you an earlier bloom. Okay. Now, tell us that these are on sale now but only until the 30th of September. And, look, we, we know anything you seem to put on the show. We, we get a lot of people say, oh, I'm, I'm so disappointed, I missed out, I'm going to have to wait till next year now. But but this is the chance. This is people's opportunity to get online, get their order in and have them delivered. Um, so it's go straight to gardenexpress.com.au. And what's the deal? What, what do they cost? Look, there's a, there's a very wide range depending on, on how long it's taken us to uh, to produce that bulb, how well it reproduces. All of those things determine price, Trevor. So okay. there's some that are quite expensive, but we started around $20 for a hippie astrum. And the uh -huh. best deal are our collections. We've got uh, five collections this year, including a new release collection, and they're saving 20%. 20%. All right. Well, listen, I... I... You know, I know I placed an order last week, but I need to place an order this week. Can you look after me with this one as well? Uh, I think you'll have to give me your selections, Trev, because as you said, some of them will be selling really fast. The colours are delicious. Uh, and there's oh. too many for me to know what you're going to like. So uh, Okay. okay. So I'm, I, I jump on online and I can have a look at your online catalogue and select from there. That's the best way to do it? Yeah, we've got an e-catalogue. So if you're on the mail list, we should be emailing you, I think, a, a link to the catalogue. Uh, it's a flip book, so you can just press on the screen and go from page to page and place your order from the products there, or otherwise they're, they're in the category Hippie Astrums on the web store at gardenexpress.com.au. David Van Berkel, fantastic. You've done it again. Thanks so much for joining us today, mate. Great talking to you all. Thank you. <laughs> See ya. Ah, oh, I love that bloke. He has got so many amazing plants that he keeps releasing all the time. And this is what it's all about is this kind of introducing new things into our gardens, bringing colour. The idea of these bulbs, growing them in a pot um, as soon as you get them and then bringing them inside when these huge flowers emerge, it's just, it's a great way to sort of bring colour inside the house. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, <clears throat> let's have a look here. We've got lots of questions coming in, and this is we're on the home run. So let's uh, let's get your questions in. Let me know where you are. Um, that will help us a lot. Erin has done that. She's in Brisbane. She's got a sad confetti syngonium. Now I got it as a cutting grown in water, then planted in premium potting mix. Now it slowly dropped all its leaves and hasn't grown since. And has just two little leaves. What can I do to improve its health? It's a really bizarre thing because if it's in a good potting mix. That is a plant you should see turn around. Now, the only thing may be is if you've, if you've done the transfer in the middle of winter because they really do need a little bit of warmth. So try and get into the warmest possible spot in the house up against a window at the moment so that it really does warm it up. And that will definitely stimulate new growth. That fertilizer that we featured earlier on today um, with Karen Goldie, that is probably the one that you might want to give it a little bit of a shot of that and then move to the pour and feed afterwards. And uh, as I said, weekly with that, and you will end up uh, with some pretty incredible growth results. I am sure it will give it a big turnaround. But it's it, more than anything, Erin, I think it's probably just a little bit of warmth that it needs at the moment. Carolyn is in Victoria. 
do I fertilize my orchids now that they're in flower? Well, actually, Carolyn, believe it or not, you can fertilize your orchids now that they're in flower. That's that's actually all okay to do that. Um, pretty much the, the flower set, um, the only thing you're going to do is possibly increase a little bit of the, the vividness of the color and possibly the size of the flower. So it does help a little bit, but definitely once it's finished flowering, it pulls all its energy into producing those flowers. After it's done that, you should be giving them a regular liquid feed. And I'm assuming at the moment that we are talking about Symbidium orchids because they are just magnificent right across Australia. Jen is in Victoria too. Jen, uh, my question is about tulips. How many blooms does one bulb have during the season? For a start, it only has one. Also, I noticed, um, noticed one of the flowers uh, now has aphids. I just scraped it away. But will the blooms get destroyed if insecticide is sprayed on? Now, look, no, as a general comment, um, it, it shouldn't do. I would be looking at a very light um, spray of something that's got pyrethrum in it, to be quite honest, just for the aphids, because um, they will get on to the, the soft tissue of the flowers. Um, but uh, you should only get one flower per bulb if you've got nice, big, mature bulbs. And um, you definitely got to be on top of those aphids. You've got one shot at it. So make sure that they don't spoil the flower. Um, Carol is in Perth. When do I plant gladiolos? Mine are just starting to stick their heads up in the garden. So you should have either already got them in or do it right now because mine are just pushing growth out of the soil um, as we move into spring and we get more light days. Uh, and they do grow very well during the summer months, producing lots of flower throughout summer. Cherie is a good friend of ours in Bunyip in Victoria. Should I start planting my tomato seeds yet? Cherie, um, absolutely. And, uh, you know, this, uh, the Grossliss uh, variety from uh, Mr. Fothergills, um, this is the perfect way to do it. Grow your tomatoes from seed, plant your seed now. You cannot go wrong. Really good way to go. Uh, let's keep moving along. Barbara, we're not sure where you're from, Barbara. Do I fertilize native plants now? Well, look, you, you can do. Um, they are in their, their real big growth period at the moment, most of them producing a lot of flour. So if you do feed them, you are going to support flowering. There is no doubt about it. Um, probably once they've finished flowering, that's a really good time to try and stimulate a little bit more growth when they're in the peak of the growth season and support that. Obviously, most native plants, and this is this big word that we use, natives, and native's good. Well, natives are good, but uh, Tasmanian tree fern is a native. Uh, foxtail palm is a native from Queensland, and, uh, you know, grevillea is a native sometimes, or well, some grevillea is a native to, um, to, to the southwest of WA, whereas you've got others that are native to um, the mid coast and, and the, the north of New South Wales that are quite tropical. They're all different. So using the word native can be quite deceptive and a little bit misleading if I have to say that generally. What I would say to you is if you've got endemic species, species that come from within 100 kilometres of where you live, they should probably um, do a lot better in your garden environment. And uh, those kinds of plants probably don't need that extra fertiliser. They're probably quite adept to your garden environment. But if they are varieties like, let's say, those tropical grevilleas from, from uh, northern New South Wales and southern Queensland, then giving them a feed is probably not a bad idea. Hopefully I didn't confuse things too much there. <laughs> okay. Um, Cheryl and Marcus in Mandra, what are the best native trees and shrubs for, for uh, to plant for doves to nest in? That's an interesting one. Um, now, doves, like all birds, are looking for protection. So often um, you'll find doves are nesting in trees. That tends to be what they, they do. And um, there are a whole bunch of, of different eucalypts, for example, that are fabulous for, for that particular purpose. Some of these grafted flowering gums are magnificent, but a lot of them are dwarf and it's probably not tall enough for them to want a dove to, or for a dove to want to put a nest into. So you do want something that's going to be a little bit bigger. So a gonus, there's a whole bunch of different types of a gonus, like after dark or the, the standard agonis flexuosa, the WA weeping peppermint tree, make great nesting trees for birds. Um, and uh, you're in you're in Mandra, so that's in WA. So that would be a great tree. And as I said, you know, pretty much all the all the eucalypts. One uh, that I used to have at home in my old home that was great was the Grevillea robusta, the tree Grevillea. Uh, that's a that's a great tree, very fast growing, really good um, for for all sorts of birds. To be quite honest, because the flowers are so beautiful and so rich in nectar. 
Um, it really is a, a um, fabulous tree option for you. Michelle, we're not sure where you're from, but uh, you've got a problem that I've got in my garden. So uh, tamarillos are a South American tree that produces a fruit that's very much like a tomato. In fact, it's often called the tree tomato for that reason. Um, it's a, it's just for those people who don't know tamarillos, interesting fruit because it is a savory fruit. So it's fabulous with cheeses and biscuits and things like that. It's not so much that sweet fruit that you'd be sitting and just eating necessarily just as a fruit by itself. Now yours has been badly affected by recent frosts. It's starting to get some new shoots. Can I recommend anything to do to give it a boost before spring? You've sea salt it. Well, sea salt is a really good soil tonic. Uh, tonic. It is very good. It helps plants resist damage from frosts. What I would recommend you do is you probably give it a liquid feed right now, and that's over the foliage, that new foliage that's emerging. Um, those nutrients are absorbed through the leaves, so it stimulates really good growth. And at exactly the same time, I'd be getting some osmocote probably is the best thing to do. It's going to give three to six months of good food supply and that's steadily delivered to the roots over that period of time. It's a really important thing, Michelle. Um, it's small amounts on a regular basis to live a lot better, more robust growth, and that'll get your tamarillo back. But look, the, the real key is a bit of warmth, and uh, and that's what I'm waiting for in my garden. I'm sure that's what your tamarillo is waiting for in your garden. Now, one of our great favourites, Tala, from the Central Tablelands in New South Wales, has joined us again. Tell her your question is the mulberry's coming back in, into fashion and you'd like to relive a piece of a childhood. What's a good variety for the central tablelands? I have a friend uh, who lives uh, up in P uh, Picolpin, um, up in, uh, it's not quite the tablelands, but it's certainly uh, more central, it's north of Sydney. They have the, um, the traditional black English um, mulberry. It is without doubt probably one of the best, but you are very lucky there because you can grow a lot of different varieties and there's a few different varieties you could look out for. The white tends to be a bit too sweet for a lot of people, really prolific, quite large tree, um, produces literally tens of thousands of fruit once it's a mature tree. Um, but there is another form of that. So these are what they call the chartoute mulberries and there's a red form of it and I just love it. It's a lot more compact growing. Um, it is an interesting tasting fruit. It's tangy like sherbet is the best way I could um, describe it. Um, it's it's sweet but tangy and it's absolutely delicious. That's called the red chartoute. So I would go for the old fashioned black English or the chartoute. That's my suggestions for you, Tal. I hope that helps. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, this is the time of the year to be getting your mulberries into your garden. Anne-Marie is in the central west of New South Wales. What are the easiest fruit and vegetables to grow for learners, please? Well, look, you know what? There's so many, but you can't go, when it comes to, to veggies, just cannot go past things like tomatoes. They really are almost indestructible once they get going. Um, so definitely get your tomatoes in. Uh, first crops are always going to do well. There are a lot of, uh, of those fast-growing veggies like... Um, things such as, uh, well, your lettuce, your salad, but more broadly, your salads overall, because you can put mizuna in, you can you can put traditional lettuce varieties, um, whether they be things like iceberg or, or the ones that you can just keep be picking small leaves all the time. Um, there's a whole range of those things and you can't go wrong in growing those. Trick with them is to make sure that they are in full sun, that they have free draining soil and that they have regular water. And as long as your soil's got a reasonable nutrient level in it, maybe you give them a feed. When they're first getting going, you will get great results. I hope that helps Anne-Marie in the central west of New South Wales. Barbara uh, is in the Snowy Mountains. I'm desperate to get screening going over the three sides, my double house block. Bamboo is the only thought I've had for that. I, look, I love bamboo and um, those clumping bamboo varieties are just brilliant love for that sort of thing. Um, Timor Black is probably the one, it's one that I've got in my garden, does incredibly well. Um, that's the bamboos. The ones that if you want something that's going to grow very quickly, um, there is a whole range of um, sozygiums or the, the lily pillies. Um, when I say a whole range, lots of different foliage characteristics, colours, 
and also sizes. So you can go anything from one called Tiny Trev, which is a very compact form, small leaves, um, great for hedging, for small hedges, uh, right through to Bush Christmas, right through to, look, there's so many of them at the moment, um, but, but end up being big screening plants that really do a great job for you. And they're probably, in your situation, what I would recommend, Barbara, I would suggest you go that way. How's that? We have done very well. Um, thank you so much for joining us a little bit later today. Remember, go and get your jab. We want everybody to remain healthy and happy. And look, I did it not for me. Uh, I did it for everybody who I work with, for all my friends, um, for all those people that I spend time with um, to make sure that they're safe and healthy. And that's how we should be looking at it. This is something we all have to deal with together. So I'm not going to preach on it. I just wanted to let you know that I've done it. Hopefully you will too. Now Lachlan's going to send a message out um, and our seed and book winners will know soon after the show is finished. Garden Gurus is back. I'm very excited. This weekend, it's Saturday, the 21st of August on Channel 9. Now we're playing at 2.30pm uh, in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland and at 4.30pm in the Northern Territory, WA and South Australia. Check your local TV guides to make sure that you don't miss us. There are a few changes on the times uh, as currently Channel 9 have a lot of sport on and we're just a gardening show, so we'll dance around the outside of it and take our spot. Remember, we've got this $20,000 garden makeover competition running this season of the Garden Gurus. Please, please enter. What a great prize to win. We'll have competition details right here on our Facebook page soon after the show has gone to air. And remember, you can always get information about gardening from us. We have a great website. You can also catch up on previous stories from previous episodes of The Garden Gurus at The Garden Gurus TV or on our YouTube channel, which is thegardengurus.tv. And you can listen back to today's live stream and catch up on previous episodes uh, of our Garden Gurus live series here on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Audible. They are great platforms for you to be able to have a listen to what we talked about today in your own time when you want to. Please tell your friends about it too. That really does make our day. We'll be back next Monday. Make sure you tune in, 12 p.m. We'll be back to our normal time, Australian Eastern Standard Time. It's 10 p.m. Western Standard Time. Wow, busy day. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Trevor Cochran. Happy gardening. We'll see you again soon. This show is brought to you by The Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Visit the Garden Guru's online store and browse through a collection of high-quality, German-made wolf garden tools. You'll also find a range of books with information to help create and maintain a beautiful garden. You can also access the online store on the Garden Guru's Facebook page, 